So the second part of this series of God is speaking today to you is that somebody else is speaking. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible states this in chapter 14, verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kind of voices. And the word for voices here is our tone, sounds, languages in the world. And none of them are without significance. In other words, each of these voices, these languages want to speak to you and want to influence you to some part, some way. But we know that we as believers are called to hear God's voice and that we are to know his voice and the sheep will not follow another voice. But we have to rightfully distinguish between these other voices. Now, these voices fall into three different categories. They could be either be coming from God, they can be coming from the devil, and, or they most likely are coming from your thoughts. And so we have to distinguish, are these God thoughts or are these fleshly thoughts? Are these natural thoughts or are they spiritual thoughts? And so we are quickly reminded that Deception is a real thing. How many people know that deception is a real thing, especially during these times and these seasons that you are now living in? In Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise up and show great signs and wonders, even to deceive, if possible, the very elect. And we know that it only takes a little bit of deception. Look, I don't have to tell you a 100% lie. It only takes a little bit of deception, a little bit of leaven to leaven the whole loaf. Amen? And check this out. We are all candidates for deception. There is nobody above deception and when you become a candidate for deception and you receive that deception with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they do not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. The devil's job He's been doing it for a long time as we look at that scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The devil's job is to what? Deceive you. He's called in that chapter a lying wonder. He lies to people. He deceives people. And check this out. The devil's been doing it for 6,000 years. He's been deceiving people for 6,000 years, and you left to your own vices will be deceived, guaranteed. You are not about de deception. In fact, you become a candidate for deception when you think you're not a candidate for deception. Does that make sense? And check this out. A little bit of deception, a little leaven, as you take that further and further out, becomes a gross lie out there. What is the way that the enemy will deceive you? He will tell you about your fleshly nature and your desires there. When we listen to our flesh, fleshly led soul, this is what happens. But each one of you is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed by them. That is James chapter 1, verse 14. When we start to not be led by God's spirit, but are led by our flesh, we become candidates to be deceived because of our fleshly desires. 
often you'll hear people that are following their fleshly desires quote this verse in Psalm 37, 4. They'll clo in fact, they only quote part of it. They said, God will give you the desires of your heart. But they don't read the verses before or after that. They ignore the rest. And here's what the rest of these group of verses say. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. I've heard many people talk about, doesn't God give you the desires of your heart? Yes, when your heart is lined up with God's heart, amen? When you are desiring what he desires, when you want what he wants, then you can be assured that you're not being deceived by hearing false voices. Another problem that we have is I have encouraged people to hear from God. But you have to be willing to be wrong. Now, what is Pastor Brett saying? That you have to be willing to be wrong. If the Apostle Paul, how many people have heard of the Apostle Paul here? If the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, for now we see in a mirror or a window dimly or a, a muddy mirror, a dirty mirror, a dirty window. If the apostle Paul can admit that he saw dimly, what should we be admitting? If the apostle Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament, can admit that he could make a mistake, who are we to say we can? It's the humility of the Apostle Paul that allowed him to write over half of the New Testament. The real big problem that I found in the body of Christ with people of our persuasion, I mean those that really believe that God does speak to them, one of the biggest problems I, f I found is pride. And, of course, we know that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit or an arrogant spirit before a fall. We got to be humble. Humble. Humble means that you, too, can make a mistake. Humble means that you're not going to always be right. And look, God can work with us when we make mistakes. What he can't work with is somebody who has pride in something, such as hearing God's voice. Now, why is this such a problem? I've discovered that this is a big problem with us because when people believe that they heard God's voice, and they didn't. They are actually saying, I'm writing Acts chapter 29. And in case you don't know, Acts only has 28 books, chapters in it. When you start to say, God told me this, and God didn't tell you that, it's a big problem. And this is not a new problem that I've encountered. This is something that has always gone on. I've heard it from the very beginning of my walk with the Lord. I heard God told me to say this, and then God told somebody else to say that, and they're contradictory thought. How can God contradict himself? How can God be saying this and then be saying that? You see the problem, don't you? You see the, pro the error in all that. 
We can't go by what you think God told you. There are safeguards that are put in place, and we're going to talk about those things right now. So how do we rightfully discern what voice is it? Is it from God? Is it from the enemy? Is it just from my fleshly thoughts and nature? You must be willing to be wrong. You have to be willing to say, hey, I might not have heard correctly. Now, let me give you an example from my own personal experience. I thought I heard God say, don't buy silver until it goes down to $14 an ounce. I'm going to get Cheryl because I know she's a, she buys silver. I, I think I heard from God about that. Don't buy any silver. Now, you got to understand, it's went above $30, and it's just slightly under $30 right now. But it's went over $30, it, but yet I'm hoping that it's going to go down to $14, and then I'm selling the farm, even though I don't have a farm, and I'm buying all the silver, okay? But. I'm also willing to be wrong about that. And guess what? If it doesn't go down to $14 an ounce and it goes up to $1,000 an ounce, this guy's happy also. But see, here's the thing is that I'm willing to be wrong about that. I'm willing to make a mistake. But if it hits $14.99, you better believe I'm buying a lot of silver. Hallelujah. So, we have to be diligent. Can you say diligent? We have to be diligent to present ourselves approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightfully discerning, dividing the word of truth, rightfully dividing what voice are you hearing from. Hallelujah. We must take the word and we must apply it to the word, amen? When you hear something that you believe from God, it has to line up with the word of God. Does that make sense? If it don't line up, you made a mistake. But if you stand on that mistake, that's when it's a problem. And we must apply this word. We talked about Hebrews 4.12. We have to apply the word of God we have to apply that voice that we're hearing to the Word of God. For the Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It is a discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God will show you if you are right or wrong. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just say this. You have to know the word, and you have to rightfully apply the word. If you don't do that, your soulish thoughts, the thoughts that come into your mind, you don't know if they're God thoughts or if they're from your flesh, which is connected to this world thoughts. Secondly, is secondly a word? Okay, good. Secondly, be willing to take wise counsel. Now, I know that there could be foolish counsel out there, but be willing to take wise counsel. Proverbs talks about wise counsel. In Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, Plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. And let me add godly advisors. Proverbs 19.20 says, Listen to advice, accept instruction, that you may gain wisdom in the future. And there's other scriptures. Well, I'll just read one more. Proverbs 24.6, For by wise guidance you, will, you can wage your war. 
in the abundance of counselors, you will have victory. I want to say this. God speaks through his body. God speaks through his body. God does not send out a word that's not associated with his body. This is why we have this table of fellowship up here. We believe that as we fellowship, not just with God, but with each other, that we are going to understand the will and the plans of God. Amen? That God doesn't just speak through one person. And we have to accept this. God speaks through his body. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, Every word shall be established. Many people that are in the charismatic movement of born-again believers don't abide by this. That's a pity. This is a safeguard that God has placed in, placed in the body that will safeguard you from making serious mistakes. We have to stop prefacing God said this and God said that before everything we say. You don't get any more kudos from me when you say God said this or God said that. Look. I want to know what God is saying to you. But I am going to take that word and I'm going to rightfully discern it with the help of, of others in our congregation. Does that make sense? I don't want to just take your word about it. I need to hear two or three witnesses this is what the word of God tells us. This is not disputable. It's not arguable. This is just what God tells us. I'm not even supposed to receive a word you might have unless I have two or three witnesses. Does that make sense, everybody? I want you to understand that I have to protect you. My job as a shepherd is to protect you. And you can't let everybody speak over you. You can't let receive everything everybody says. Every word has to be established by two or three witnesses. Every thought that you get has to be proven by two or three witnesses. I can't just go into... Our courtroom, which is, by the way, based off of the Bible, I can't go into the courtroom and accuse somebody of murdering somebody else, raping somebody else, unless there are two or three witnesses with me. These are become false accusations if they're not provable. Because, see, the crazy thing is, we could say whatever we wanted to. And that's kind of where our society is going today. Our society is going to where I, I could accuse you of something 30 years ago, not have any proof, and your name is trash. Back in the day, if I accused an official of something in the newspaper, y'all remember those? If I accuse somebody in the newspaper, it's front page headline. But then when it gets disproved, they put it on page 13. See, accusations are dangerous because you think God told you that. We have to get better at that. We've got to be willing to admit that we could be wrong. And we have to trust God enough to wait for those two or three witnesses to establish a word 
if it's true. We got to await evidence. And just like I told you about silver, you know when I have the evidence that God spoke that to me? Guess when? When it hits fourteen ninety nine. When it hits fourteen ninety nine, I know I should go buy a boatload of silver, okay? You see what I'm saying? I'm trying to tell you how we can beat the curve during these times, during these seasons. We can know what God wants to do. We can be ahead of the curve before crazy things happen, but we need to learn to be a congregation that God speaks through, not just individuals. The Bible is, is supposed to be preeminent as we hear the voice of God. We have to know Scripture. The problem, you know what the problem is? This is where I want to walk all around. You know what the problem is? The problem is we don't know the Bible. We don't know the Bible. You know, you haven't heard about this or wise counsel or, or uh, that the devil is a lying wonder because you haven't read the word of God. Now, what are we supposed to do when that voice that we're hearing in our thoughts and it doesn't line up with these safeguards? It doesn't line up with the word of God. It, it hasn't been brought before wise counsel. And it does not have two or three witnesses. Where this voice may have lined up with the desires of our heart. Where the enemy sent that voice to deceive us, to cause damage within the body. What do we have to do? First thing I want to tell you is that I believe my... I believe everybody has an anointing from God. They have a special gift from God. My anointing is to hear from God. I have a special gift that I've been able to hear from God. I'm able to discern his voice. I've been practicing it for a long time. I do think you get better at it uh, as you grow in the faith. But I've I've been hearing from God, and I I can hear I can tell you when I hear from God and when I don't. But see, I apply these principles when I think I'm hearing from God. Does it line up with the Word of God? Does it contradict the word of God? If it's something significant, I have an advisory board that I can go to. Are there witnesses? Is, are other people that I haven't told, are they agreeing with that? Does it make sense? Does it make godly sense? I look for things that are coming, that come through me, not through my logic, not through my um, putting line upon line, precept upon precept. I look for things that are God, and I understand when it's God. God has taught me how to hear his voice. I want to close with this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we have some, a, a pretty famous part of Scripture. 
that most of you know about. Starting at verse 3, chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. For we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You always have to be reminded that you have, how many people have flesh here? You have flesh. And what does that simply mean? That you are in connection. You are in connection with this world. And guess who's the prince of the, this world? Satan. But God wants you to know that he has weapons. And his weapons of warfare are not fleshly in nature, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. God has a weapon against the flesh. It's called the spirit of God, which is meant to be connected to your spirit. And he tells us how to operate in this weapon. Casting down arguments in everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If you are getting thoughts, arguments that are coming against God and his word, God and his unity, you have to take that into consideration. And then we are to bring those thoughts. We are supposed to take every thought into ca captivity of Jesus Christ. Take every thought. Understand why you're thinking things. Understand where they're coming from. Is it lining up with God's word? Does that make sense? And then you've got to destroy every thought that's not lining up with the will of God. Amen? Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. God wants you to take every thought, every voice, Everything that's coming to you. Understand where it's coming from. Understand what it's trying to do. Is it trying to divide the body of Christ? Is it trying to stop the purpose of Jesus? Take that thought and take it to God and let God change it. Don't, don't take, don't leave those thoughts lingering in here. You've got to destroy them. You've got to punish them. And then we got something. Then we got people that are truly hearing from God. Now I know that we are a people in process. We are people that God is trying to convert. We have not arrived. We have not made it to where we can clearly always hear the voice of God. But God has applied, supplied safeguards against that. We have to be obedient to these things that God has supplied. This, my friends, is what defeats the enemy. This, my friends, is a weapon. When a lie comes in, when a deception comes in, that you destroy it with the truth of God. Amen? That's all God wants to do. He wants to destroy lies with truth. So today, today, I ask, I humbly ask that you be humble enough to receive this word. 
to understand that you may be hearing other voices than God. And then to do something about it. To, to walk it out. To live it. So that we can rightfully hear the voice of God. We need to hear from God unlike ever before. Next week we're going to be talking about the power of hearing God's voice. The power of knowing what God wants to do. But you got to... You got to deal with the false voices first. You can't just keep on receiving, God told me this, God told me that. God don't tell you all that. God don't tell you a mess. God don't tell you to do certain things. They don't make sense. They don't make spiritual sense with the word of God and with the character of God. Amen? So let me pray for you. Let's all stand. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our path. It's your word. And, Father, right now we just stand on your word. Hallelujah. And right now we command every voice that's not of God to shut up in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, let your people hear truth. Hallelujah. Let them hear your voice. Hallelujah. Let them reject the lie. And let them receive truth. So, Lord, bless your people today. Let them surrender to you, to your word, to your ways. I ask this in the name above every name, Jesus Christ. Thank God. Amen.